I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. Did you get Hello, oh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. It is Monday, it is almost summertime, and it's almost June. June is pretty busy, if you haven't noticed. Um, we have tours nearly every day in June, so please take a look at Volunteer Spot. Apparently, we don't go on vacation in the summer. It's just like the school year. So um, we still need a lot of people in June. Please take a look at Volunteer Spot. Um, we are meeting with the docent council today after this training. Um, one thing I know ahead of time about uh, one of the committees is Sonia Ramsey is looking for people to help us update Speakers Bureau materials. We're going to take a look at the slideshows and uh, the notes and rehash them, redo them for our new museum. Um, so I have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to be on this committee to help us this summer do some research, some reading, some writing. Um, it'll be a fun project. We're going to start June 16th. Um, I think that's all my announcements. We have the docent luncheon next Wednesday. And um, that's it. And have a great Memorial Day weekend. And stop in and see me if you have any questions. I'm going to turn it over to Anastasia. Today we are learning about uh, how Picasso came to be, how this exhibition came to be, the kind of background activity that takes place for a big exhibition, so it's really interesting. All right, well, thank you. Uh, I think I got one of these. Am I on? Oh, I am on. Woo, that is loud. All right, hi. How's everyone doing? Um, so this is an exhibition that kind of grew out of pretty much the long road to the Picasso show that the curatorial staff embarked on. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, better. Oh, now I can see everyone. Much better. Um, so this exhibition grew out, or this exhibition, this presentation grew out of uh, a couple docents and Stephanie asking me if I could kind of give you guys a background of how we go from uh, someone going, wouldn't it be nice if we had some Picassos here to, we have a bunch of Picassos here and the press and all of that fun stuff. Um, so I'm going to start with this slide, does anyone, everyone know, have an idea what this is? So, uh, so this is a picture of the Paris Salon from the uh, 18th century. And this is kind of the ancestor of what exhibitions are today. Uh, and it's more, more akin to a biennial or a yearly exhibition like the Whitney Biennial. But basically, artists would submit their work. They would be hung here. And patrons would come, would look at the work. Uh, reviews of the artwork would go into the newspapers. Uh, the first catalog started to become published. Uh, and basically, this is kind of where it started. And of course, it evolved over the past couple hundred years to now there we all kind of know what an exhibition is. There's a lot of varieties of them. Um, sometimes they're based on a collection. Uh, a couple, I'm sure you guys remember a Modern Dialect, the John and Susan Horseman Collection exhibition from 2014. Sometimes they're based on a theme. Uh, art and Money is a perfect example of this. Contemporary art that all speaks about the themes and issues to do with money. Sometimes they're very frequently they're about an artist's life work. 
the essential Elijah Pierce from 2012 is a perfect example for, of this. So is the George Bellows exhibition we had uh, a couple years ago. And sometimes they're even based around a work of art. For those of you that were around in 2011, we, uh, Dominique Vasseur managed to get uh, Caravaggio's Behold the Man to the Columbus Museum of Art, and we used that to build an entire exhibition of, about that. It was the only Caravaggio work in the exhibition, but it allowed us to take a look at the themes and the way artists were exploring painting in that time period. So with Picasso, the idea was, and Picasso, I should add, was curated by a guest curator. She is based in Milan. Her name is Simonetta Fraquelli, and I'm sure David will talk much more about her next, or two weeks from now. Um, so basically what you have is Picasso, right around the time of the Great World, uh, of the Great War, was exploring two themes in his art. He was making these beautiful neoclassical paintings, and at the same time, he continued to explore Cubism, which he pretty much invented with Brock in the early 20th century. So from this, we thought, uh, she thought, well, no one's really made an exhibition around this theme, so let's do that. So every exhibition pretty much starts with a checklist. You decide, I'm gonna tell this story and I'm gonna tell this story with these paintings. Whether, it's, whether you're exploring a theme or whether you're exploring an artist's work or a time period in an artist's uh, life, this is basically how you do it. So for this show, we thought, okay, so the themes are gonna be Cubism, Classicism, World War I, which is happening around the same time. And then Picasso also did his first play produ or a ballet production with Cocteau uh, called Parade, so that was included. And right around this time period, you start building your checklist. So what do you wanna include? And I should add before I keep going, uh, not all of these paintings made it to the show, and that's kind of the point of this presentation. So you're thinking, so what are we gonna include here? We're gonna include a couple of early Cuba still lives, which the exhibition is based on. I think you guys know that, um, you might have read that the entire basis of the exhibition was our really beautiful still life from the Howell Collection, still life with compote and glass. And then you look for other works from that time period that speak to that piece. Uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art had a great one. Still Life in a Landscape from the Meadows Museum was a perfect fit for this. And we also really like Viva La France from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which unfortunately we couldn't get and I can go <laughs> into why later. At the same time, Picasso is making these cubistic figures and we have a lovely one in our collection, again, from the Howled Collection, Female Nude. But we also have a Seated Man with Pipe. And again, we thought, well, you know, the Metropolitan Museum in the Lauder Collection, they have a similar piece. And we can, we can show audiences how he, again and again, explored the same kind of motif in his work. Uh, a reclining Woman is a drawing by, uh, by Picasso of his lover at the time who was dying, we were like, well, that would be another, another way he, he played on that theme. So we think, okay, Harlequins. He, he painted tons and tons of Harlequins. Jean Cocteau in 1917 appeared on Picasso's doorstep in a Harlequin outfit. And ever since that time, he would continue to paint, th paint these Harlequins. This was actually a throwback to his earlier period um, if anyone's familiar with Picasso's blue and rose period, that figure pops up again and again. And then we thought, well, he also started doing these really intricate Ang-influenced heads. Um, and they are literally called Ang heads. Um, and they're, they're these perfectly realistic drawings, which if you look at these works of art compared to these, it's pretty extraordinary that he was doing this at the exact same time, pretty much. Um, and 
just in case anyone's wondering why they are called Ang heads, here is a drawing by Ang from the Metropolitan. Um, he was deeply influenced by his work at the time. And then we thought, well, and this is where this show kind of goes out of the Great War time period because we all know the Great War ended in 1918. He kind of kept making art after that. Uh, but he started to explore these really beautiful classical figures, many of them based on his wife, uh, Olga Hochlova at the time. So, and then we thought, well, and at the same time, he continued to make these colorful still lifes. So we will add those just to tell the complete story of this evolution in his time, in his life. Right around after this period, he began to start making surrealist works, and that's around where this exhibition ends. Um, the show does, will not be going into his later 1930s surrealist work. So you have all of these kind of buckets that you decide, well, we need a little of this, a little of that, a little of that. How do we get those paintings from whatever museum or private collection, whatever mantle or storage vault they are in, to the Columbus Museum of Art? How does that actually happen? And it's kind of a process, frankly. So, and I'll go through this with you guys. So basically, the curator and the registrar, how many, out of curiosity, how many people here know what a registrar is? That's pretty good. <laughs> um, registrars, as Nanette likes to call them, are the librarians of the Columbus Museum of Art. They track where the art is, they track the condition of the art, they make sure that everything's okay in terms of whether a work can go up, um, they make travel arrangements, they basically make sure the art is where it needs to be and is cared for in the way it needs to be. So the curator and the registrar will compose a loan letter and the curator will write a justification for the work. Justifications, they're sometimes called rationales depending on what museum you work in. They are basically, we are going to borrow this artwork because. And usually the because is it demonstrates our point that we're trying to make with this exhibition perfectly or it is the only work we know of that is like this and therefore we wanna show this to our audiences in the context of this show. Curiously enough though, the cur uh, and I should add, the registrar will often add the uh, fine print to the loan letter. Uh, we will ensure the, wall, the work nail to nail, it's called. We'll make sure that the work is cared from for the moment it leaves your museum to the moment we hang it an hour's end from the moment it gets back to you to the moment it gets back to you. So the letter is written and oddly enough, and this is kind of one of those weird museum uh, quirks, though the, though the curator typically writes the loan letter, the director always signs the loan letter and loan letters always go from museum director to museum director. They'll never go to a curator and it'll always be the final call of the director whether a work goes out. The director signs a loan letter. We address it to the London Institutions Museum. A registrar will produce a form for the loan that says, what's the insurance value? How big's the work? Uh, do you have any special care requirements? And the package goes off. So the London Institution receives the loan request, and sometimes we are that London Institution because God knows our collection has traveled all over the place and has seen a lot of countries and a lot of museums. And then the registrars of the London Institution will generally request a facility report. Uh, facility reports will cover things like, what does the gallery look like? Uh, are there any, say, pipes running through the gallery? Generally, things you don't want to have around your art will be covered in that facility report. How many visitors are you expecting? Sometimes is on there. Uh, pretty much always you will find what kind of natural disasters is your area prone to? Um, fortunately, Ohio doesn't have that many, but it's, you know, I am pretty sure that at least one work has probably been denied to Florida during hurricane season. 
Um, so the request is then sent to the loan committee. And the loan committee is a curator or a couple of curators, depending on how big the institution is, a couple of registrars, some conservators, a collection manager, the director is often involved. And they sit around and they weigh all of the possible things that could happen to this work of art, um, whether it would be good for the institution to lend the piece, uh, and approve the work or not. And the trick with Picasso is, with this show is, and something we very quickly realized is, these works are so precious, and the museums that have these pieces tend to want to hang on onto them pretty tightly. Because once your Picasso is damaged or ruined or God forbid anything happens and these things are very rare, they're not a daily occurrence by any means, um, but should anything happen to it, chances are your museum is not going to get another Picasso. Um, so, when these works are sent out into the world, it's generally a big deal for the museum and for the lending institution that's getting the work. So, just so while we're on the topic of loan letters, they generally start like this. Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, who is our partner for this exhibition, if you guys don't know, um, those of you that haven't been to the Barnes, I can't urge you enough to go. It's in Philadelphia. It's one of the most beautiful museums you'll ever see. Uh, and the Columbus Museum of Art in Ohio are organizing an exhibition provisionally titled, and note that provisionally titled, Picasso and the Great War, the dates, and then it's a general exhibition description. It's nothing, no one's going to be shocked by this. And then every single work of art, as I mentioned, has a rationale. This is the rationale for uh, Minneapolis Museum of Art's Woman by the Sea. Um, and it basically, like I said, kind of gives you a framework of why we're requesting the piece. Um, and in this case, this is one of the pieces we very happily received. This is actually only going to be exhibited at the Columbus Museum of Art. If you caught the show in the barns, this is going to be your uh, seeing it here will be your chance to see this painting. So, some loans inevitably fall through, and with this show we had bunches of them fall through for tons of various reasons. Um, all of them fairly good reasons. The thing I want to emphasize is this isn't, a, it's not a reflection on us so much as a reflection on how valuable these pieces of art are and how hesitant institutions are to lend them. And especially given how many works of art are coming from overseas, it was quite the challenge getting some of these loans. So I'm going to go through a couple of examples and uh, just to show you. So we requested the still life, for example, from the National Gallery of Art. It's a 1918 still life. It's a Beautiful little piece that speaks well to the other uh, still lives in the show. And we have a great relationship with the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. We often, they often lend to us and vice versa. They have, of course, a wonderful collection, so it's a great, great museum to have a good relationship with. And the curator of the National Gallery of Art wrote us back and said, well, we would love to lend to your exhibition, it would work beautifully in your exhibition. Unfortunately, this painting is in the Chester Dale collection, which when the collection was given to the National Gallery of Art, it was given under the stipulation that it will never travel. We are not getting this piece. So we thought, ugh, darn. And then we turned around and we asked for this piece, which is actually now one of the cornerstones of the exhibition. So this is kind of the game you play with, with shows like this. A gallery or a museum or a lender even says, we can't lend you that work. So you kind of turn around and you say, but do you have that piece? Can you give us that piece instead? Um, and that's how it goes. This uh, portrait of Leonid Messine, who uh, was involved in the Parade production, 
uh, from the Art Institute of Chicago. We were really excited to get this piece. And unfortunately, it was just shown in a show of Picasso's drawings at the AIC. Uh, drawings, for those of you guys that don't know, fade extremely quickly if you expose them to any kind of light. So in general, you kind of want to not show them that often. Uh, and they said, you know, we would love to lend, but it was just on view for months, and we just can't risk it. So we turned around and we said, can we have this other picture of Leonid Messine that you guys also happen to have? And they said, sure. And actually, this turned out to be a nice little coincidence because that this picture is actually in one of the original playbills for Parade, uh, reproduced that was given out or sold when the production was uh, performed, sorry. Um, so other loans might come in a little bit late. Um, uh, Heli Nahmad, who owns the Nahmad co collection, it's a, actually a gallery based in New York and in London. Uh, fairly late in the game, Simonetta Fraquelli was looking for other works that were neoclassical figurative works from the 20s. And she said, hey, you know, you're all she was already lending one of the still lifes to the show. She said, do you mind also lending this woman in white? To which she said, of course. Uh, this piece again uh, from that later time period, uh, David Stark and Nanette, our director, actually saw in a museum in Rennes. Uh, and again, we were looking for more pieces from that period to add to our collection. And they were happy to lend to it. So we got that. This work, uh, this portrait of Olga is a, actually a very large work that's going to be in the exhibition. We could not find the private collector, which is, believe it or not, kind of a common issue where you want to borrow a work. It's not owned by an institution. It's owned by a collector somewhere out in the world. Collectors that own artwork generally don't announce themselves very much, so, so they can be a challenge to find. And we got this loan in literally the nick of time. It's in the catalog, but you'll notice that it's in the catalog as, I believe, 68A. And that's because the catalog was already laid out when the loan came in. And we were so happy we got this piece. We, of course, wanted to include it. This is a common occurrence, I should add. and. It's one of those things that, prevent, that keeps us from having to renumber the entire catalog from A to B and change all of the page numbers and all of the catalog numbers. So reasons alone might get rejected. Reasons you might not get that Mona Lisa that you really wanted for your exhibition. Um, very popular with visitors. We have rejected tons of loans that we just don't want to send out into the world because they draw visitors here. Uh, Hopper's painting, uh, Morning Sun, is a great example. Everyone loves that painting. The Columbus Museum of Art is very well known for that painting. So when people come in and they think, oh, I want to see the Hopper's Morning Sun, uh, the response, it's in Chicago right now, is generally not a very happy one. Um, major piece and reinstallation is also common, and we had a couple of Picasso works that were unable to come here because they were a cornerstone of an early 20th century gallery. Um, can't travel because it's too fragile. This is one of the most common reasons to reject a work of art. And in fact, um, a couple of our, I read an early article for um, when we got the Ciroc collection that they called some of the paintings house cats because they can't travel, because travel is actually very rough on paintings. Um, the vibrations from a truck, no matter how carefully you pack a painting, can actually shake the film, the paint film, off of a canvas. Because Picasso's paintings, especially his early paintings, often included things like sand, that kind of material can flake off at a moment's notice. And in fact, uh, we are planning another exhibition of uh, an artist named Honoré Scherer. And as I was processing the photography for the work, one museum said, as we took the painting 
off the storage rack, a tiny piece of the patent film just flew off. So these are things that museums generally don't want to happen to their artwork. And when the paintings are like a Picasso painting, so fragile and so old and so valuable, it makes institutions take a long pause before they lend them. In the process of being conserved is the process that prevents that sort of event from happening in the first place and sometimes can take a very long time because you're dealing with teeny tiny little brush strokes and processes. Um, part of a non-traveling collection, part of a non-traveling collection, by law it can't leave wherever it is, and sometimes, quite frankly, the private collector just does not want to lend the piece. They like it, it hangs in a prominent place in their house, they just don't want to give that work up. Um, I was talking to Jennifer Seeds, our exhibition registrar for the show, and she actually told me that for shows that open in January, generally they try to schedule the travel of the artwork after the holidays because private collectors want to have their artwork up for all the holiday parties and their friends. So it's important when you think about exhibitions, I think a lot of people forget because you come into the show and all the stuff's on the wall and everything, you can see everything and it's not going anywhere that these are actually physical objects. These are things that are, they, they're things. They are in people's houses and in storage vaults and wherever they are. And every exhibition consists of this process of getting them from there to here. And just in case I haven't emphasized the fragility of artwork enough, and there's probably at least one or two of you thinking, my God, museums and all these rules and all the things that they want, and the facility reports and good lord this process. Um, this is a drawing by Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, this, it's a picture of the same drawing. This is a reproduction from 1928. This is what the work looks like now. Um, and this is why we are so persnickety and <laughs> careful about making sure that this doesn't happen. Because at the end of the day, as a museum, as an institution, our job is to preserve these things so that our grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids and so on can look at these works and enjoy them just like we do. That's in a lot of ways our, the reasons museums exist is to make sure that the public has access to these works. Um, so, Let's say you get all of your loans done and in, and you have the final checklist. While this is all happening, uh, the title of any exhibition tends to change like 20 times between <laughs> the uh, conception of the exhibition and the actual exhibition. These are all of the names that the Picasso show went through from the beginning. Uh, Double Play was actually the name of the exhibition that Simonetta Fraquelli wanted. Uh, double play being a uh, reference that T.J. Clark, who's an art, art historian, made with regard to Picasso's back and forth fluctuations in uh, Cubist and Classicist movements, uh, ways of working. And then we thought, well, no one knows who T.J. Clark is except art history buffs, if that, and no, one, no one's going to get that. So we thought, well, Picasso and the Great War. Great War was going on around the same time. Added the, added the dates, took the dates off, added the explanatory uh, uh, cubism to classicism. That didn't, somewhere along the line, uh, someone said, no one, classicism, people aren't gonna care about that. So we thought experimentation and change a little bit more accessible. And then we wanted the Great War in it. It's kind of about what was going on during the Great War, and then we finally stuck the Great War next to Picasso, Experimentation and Change. That's the title of the show. Um, catalog is going on, uh, the catalog production is happening oftentimes as loans are coming in. Uh, in best case scenario, you have a completed checklist, you hand the uh, publisher the manuscript and you say, I'm done, this is it, this is what I'm publishing. 
with shoes like this, that can be a challenge because you're running against a harsh deadline for the catalog production and uh, trying to get these loans in. Um, the Picasso administration is also notoriously hard to work for, work with. Um, every single time a Picasso image is reproduced, whether in print or in a catalog, you have to ask permission from the Picasso heirs to do so. This takes about a month to turn around, and they can be very, very, very uh, persnickety about things like overprinting, which we were kind of hoping that they would approve and they did in the end. But these are challenges that come up, especially with planning a show by artists like Picasso. Matisse is another one that these shows just are so challenging to, to put together because these artists are so popular and so famous. So now you have the show, you have the catalog ready, and now you start to plan the installation. Um, how do we get from you know, a bunch of art to the art looks like this? And this is where you start to involve uh, the exhibition design staff, the registrars will generally look at every single loan request and find out if there's anything in a gallery that might uh, make the lending institution wary or unhappy. Like I said, pipes are a common one. Uh, sunlight is a big one for obvious reasons. Lending institutions generally are not fans of sunlight. Um, and then you have the fairly uh, common questions like, what colors are the walls going to be? Something that you have to think about when you are hanging these works. And something that I should add has to be done long in advance of the works getting here because you do not want to be painting those walls with a million dollar Picasso sitting in a corner. Um, how many works per gallery? You have to space these things out. Where did the labels go? Do we need to build walls? Because that is something that we do in a museum. We actually put the walls up and take them down. Um, and when will the couriers get here? So couriers for shows like Picasso, you have people that travel with the artwork that's in a crate. They will watch that crate from the moment it leaves their museum to the moment it is unpacked and that painting is hanging on a wall at its final destination. Um, for some artworks, um, museums don't send couriers. If you're borrowing a regionalist painter from 30 years ago that five people know about, generally a museum will be like, just, it's fine, we trust you. Uh, for Picasso, that is generally not the case. There are couriers for tons of these paintings, and in fact, last I looked, I think there are 20 couriers for the show. Um, these people don't come in one big group. Of course, they come individually over the course of a number of days. But the trick is, is you have to know where that painting is going when they get here, because you are not going to be moving it once they leave. So we use this very high tech and sophisticated method of planning out the galleries. Um, and I should add, some of, some of the curators use SketchUp, which is an AutoCAD program, and this is all digital. Um, the rest of us kind of like to just tape little to size paintings to walls because, and sometimes it's a mix of both. Um, so we basically plan out the entire show before it gets here. And actually with this, this was kind of a challenge because Simonetta Fraquelli, as I mentioned, she's based in Milan. Uh, so a lot of this was over a conference call with about five people huddled around a giant model of the new wing moving teeny tiny paintings around as we try to figure out where they're gonna go. Um, and now you guys know it all. Um, so eventually you kind of come to a conclusion that this is what it's gonna look like. Uh, Michelle uh, Gaudet, our exhibition designer, will put everything together in one of these beautiful layouts. We'll send it back and forth a couple of times, work out the little kinks in it, and this doesn't look as good there, so on and so forth. And then the crates start to come in, and the couriers start to come in. 
Uh, I should add that I really wanted to show you guys a picture of crates in our museum, but it is our practice not to show those pictures uh, publicly because it's a security risk and you kind of don't want to do that. Fortunately, the Newark Museum in uh, sunny Newark, New Jersey doesn't care as much. Uh, this is so I found this on the internet. And this is generally what how artwork travels. They are in big wooden crates that look like they're from 100 years ago. And one of the things that Jennifer pointed out to me that I just thought was so cool is that certain institutions will color their boxes a certain way. So you'll all, so what, whoever the courier is will always know to, for example, follow the neon green box because that's where their, art, their artwork is. And you have to understand, these people are looking at art as it goes into an airplane, through customs, out of the airplane, onto the truck. They're traveling with the truck. So, and eventually they all come here, we hang you up, and we have a show. I'm going to leave you guys with this image. This is opening night of one of the Paris salons uh, that I started the presentation out with. Um, this is actually called the Varnissage Night. And what they are doing is these are actually the artists varnishing their own work as patrons kind of enjoy their uh, member preview party. Um, we won't be doing this with Picasso. <laughs> so that's it. <clears throat>
you know, standing in the middle of a street in Manhattan. It's in customs in an airport, so you have the TSA and all of the things that happen in airports, so. Um, and then onto a truck and here, so. In your love letter, what did you estimate the visitor count to be? You generally don't estimate visitor counts in loan letters. You're just, like, it's more of a, the loan letter is, much, the loan letter comes in terms of conceptualizing an artwork long before you even have visitor accounts. You're just kind of going on the, well, it's Picasso, so <laughs> we'll get some visitors. Um, what do you estimate, pardon? What do you estimate the visitors to be? Mindy? <laughs> It varies. Um, this show, um, for very big, important ex exhibitions like this show, um, uh, museums will sometimes apply for federal indemnity, and the federal government helps museums out, because otherwise, these paintings would not be in the United States. A lot of these works are coming from private coll collectors. Um, we're, lent we're borrowing from three museums of Picasso's work in Europe. And these things are expensive and frankly beyond the capability of any small nonprofit institution. Um, but for smaller shows, it's generally the museums take care of it. And by and large, all works, whenever museums lend works are, as I mentioned, they're insured nail to nail, which means that they are insured from the moment they leave point A to the moment they come here, back to when they come here. I mean, there is not a single millisecond when these works don't have coverage because they are what they are. It's a big deal to have these pieces travel. Funny, I've never made the count. Um, probably about 10 museums in the US. Um, and the three museums from Europe uh, are the Musée Picasso, Muse uh, Musée Picasso Barcelona, uh, Paris, and uh, Faba, which is uh, Bernard Ruiz Picasso, Picasso's grandson and his wife's institution. But there, um, and Malaga, there is a painting coming in from uh, Musée Picasso, Malaga. And then um, we also have uh, a bunch of works coming in from private collectors in Europe. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, as far as I know, that was the first time that there was a mass shooting type situation um, occurring in, in a museum exhibition. Um, and all of the loans that for this show were done way in advance of that. So if it did, we, don't, we didn't fortunately have a chance to find out, so. I mean, it's, uh, there's no like daily like inspection of the works, but what will happen is when the, um, the crate is opened, um, or actually before the crate's opened, before the work gets sent anywhere, the registrars will do a condition report saying the work has a scratch in left corner and maybe there's a flake missing here, what, so on and so forth. And when the crate is opened in its, uh, final destination, as it were, they will do another condition report. 
uh, to corroborate whether there is any change. And then oftentimes before the work is sent back, there will be a condition report. And of course, our very good <laughs> gallery associate team is constantly keeping an eye on stuff and making sure that there isn't anything uh, fishy going on. But there isn't um, a daily check of what's going on. Although I will say this, uh, in the Barnes Foundation, that collection doesn't travel. None of those paintings ever go anywhere. So, um, and it's on display, you can kind of like, if you were in the mindset to move a little vase or something, you could do that. And their staff will go through the gallery every single day with an iPad and look on the iPad of the gallery space as it should be and kind of uh, make note of any changes. <laughs> Oh, Morning Sun, Hopper's Morning Sun. Oh my God, that painting has get, been in so many countries. It has been in uh, like five venues in Japan, all across the US. It's been to South America, it's been to Europe a bunch of times. That is hands down our most traveled work. I was surprised when the, uh, was it MoMA did their show? Mm -hmm. in New York Times advertised the show, it was ours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is, it is, and her work is, again, very popular. She's one of the few uh, female painters from that time period, so a lot of people really, really um, uh, want to see those paintings. And for what it's worth, we're doing a similar thing that MoMA did with our painting with uh, um, the Harlequin from the National Gallery of Art. You'll see that a lot on advertisements. It's very common for museums to use one of the works they're borrowing as advertisement because people are excited to see a painting that they wouldn't otherwise get a chance to see, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually the reason for that is that you want to be really careful with these kind of works. And frankly, a lot of lending institutions, we will, they will not let you hang your work in a gallery if they see light, natural light coming in. And this is kind of controversial because nowadays there's a lot of research done and you know some UV blocking glass uh, conservators say, oh, it's fine, it's not a big deal. Um, but in general, museums tend to be conservative about these kind of issues for obvious reasons. So um, they will, the couriers will just say, I, you can't hang it there, <laughs> and I'm not leaving until you don't hang it there. So you generally don't want that situation to ever come up. So there's a lot of planning that goes into it to make sure that paintings are in places that have no light what's, or have no natural light. Yeah. Uh, do we have to block the light? Yeah, and I mean, that's just kind of what you have to do. And like I said, these kind of things seem harsh and very strict and conservative, but we want our 
we want future generations to see this work and to enjoy it and to have the opportunity to spend time with it the way we have and that's why we do these things. Um, I should add that private collectors often care a little bit less, galleries are a little bit more lenient with this sort of stuff, but I think because museums are um, given this mission to protect these works for the public good, uh, that's why they are so, so strict about it. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, we would never reframe a lending institution's work. Um, although sometimes a show, if it's oftentimes with uh, retrospectives for artists that haven't been given a lot of attention, if you are doing the first big show of whoever's work, they'll sometimes be, um, as a part of the exhibition planning, money set aside to reframe or frame for the first time certain pieces of that artist's work. But yeah, uh, works get reframed for exhibitions all the time. It's just generally the lending institution that does it, not the borrower. Jerry? The planning for this show began, I believe, in 2011 or 2012. Um, and that's very typical. That's very, very, very common. Uh, for a minor show, two years, two to three years is generally a good, solid timeline. Um, and you have to understand the, it's, from the moment you think, wouldn't it be nice to have a show of blank to the point that loan requests go out, the period of research between point A and point B might be very long, especially if the artist's work hasn't been explored or the time period hasn't been explored. So it's very much an academic pursuit in that way, um, and those kind of things take a long time. Some exhibitions are in planning for practically a decade or more before they actually are on the walls and people enjoy them. Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> um, always varies. There's always a different reason. Um, sometimes you want to set a mood. Like the Caravaggio, they had that big dark red. Um, it gives it that beautiful Baroque flavor. Um, for this, for example, you guys will notice that the sections that talk about parade, the ballet performance, will be red. And I'll just kind of, it's a way to like jump the visitor out of looking at Picasso works too. Oh, the section is talking about something else. Um, there's that. If it's one color for the entire show, sometimes it's just something as simple as, this color looks really good with these paintings. This is the one. Mm -hmm. um, the, big, the big one for uh, the local work that's going to be displayed is uh, Frank and Susan Mott. And they are going to be lending uh, the only oil painting that Jacques Lipschitz ever produced in his life. Uh, he made the painting in 1917. It's another still life with compote. Uh, compote is just for the record, just so I'm covering all the bases, a fruit stand on a stem. If you ever hear compote, in, at least in this context, that's what it is. Um, but we were very fortunate to have that piece. We've actually displayed it in our permanent, uh, permanent collection installations before. So when they offered to lend it to the show to kind of, because we have an entire section of work by non artists that are not Picasso, we were so thrilled to be able to include that piece. It was perfect time period, perfect subject matter. You mentioned the bridge painting. What example would you point under the camera? Oh, oh, oh. 
Um, actually, if uh, everyone's all right, well, then I'm going to hand the floor off to Mindy because she, I think, has a couple of. Am I doing this? Am I on the right track? Sure. Sometimes it's common knowledge. Like people generally know the Barnes collection doesn't travel, um, but there's no. Okay, I thought just like the research. Nah. <laughs> one last question. Oh. 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 Um. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. I am, OK, so I am the uh, assistant curator at the Columbus Museum of Art, which is, uh, generally means I am over in uh, Baton Hall working on my little computer. Uh, I shepherd publications along. I help in uh, early exhibition planning stages. And before I was what I am today, uh, I was a student at the Cooper Union in New York City. And then I worked at a big historical gallery in New York for a little bit and moved to Columbus, kind of made work and spent a little bit trying to decide what I want to do and finally realized that all I really want to do is work in a museum for the rest of my life and look at beautiful things, because why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, so I was Melissa Wolf, who is our used to be our American curator. I was her intern for about a little under two years, and then I became the curatorial assistant here, and now I'm the assistant curator, which is a funny little uh, semantic play, but means a lot to me. So um, I am at your service. <laughs>